Nephrolithiasis, kidney stones. Introduction. Nephrolithiasis is the precipitation of solute, normally present in the urine, as a stone. Peak incidence is 45 to 70 years. Kidney stones form due to a high concentration of solutes in the urine and low urine volume. They present with colicky pain and hematuria, often with unilateral flank tenderness. Kidney stones are classified by their crystalline composition into the following major types. Calcium, most common. Calcium oxalate, 70 to 80 percent. Calcium phosphate, 15 percent. Calcium carbonate, they are spheres with radial striations. Ammonium magnesium phosphate, struvite, coffin lid appearance. Uric acid, cysteine, hexagonal in shape. Tyrosine crystals, bundle of needles appearance. Calcium stones. Calcium stones are the most common cause of nephrolithiasis in adults and represent 80% of renal stones. Of the patients with calcium stones, calcium oxalate stones are more common than calcium phosphate stones. Idiopathic hypercalciuria in the setting of normal calcemia is the most common combination of urine and serum calcium levels in patients that present with calcium stones. Paradoxically, hypocalcemia can also lead to calcium oxalate stones because calcium binds oxalate. Thus, in low calcium states, there will be insufficient calcium to bind oxalate allowing the increased free oxalate to precipitate and form stones. The type of calcium-containing kidney stone that is formed depends on the urine pH. Increased pH leads to the formation of calcium phosphate stones. Decreased pH leads to the formation of calcium oxalate stones. Patients with Crohn's disease have an increased risk of calcium oxalate stones because the inflammation of the small bowel leads to increased reabsorption of oxalate. Pathophysiology Crohn's disease causes inflammation of the small intestine. Inflammation in the small intestine impairs the absorption of fat. Increased fat in the small intestine binds calcium, leaving free oxalate to be absorbed and deposited in the kidney. Calcium oxalate crystals. They're classically seen in the urine of individuals who have ingested ethylene glycol, the major toxin in antifreeze. These crystals are formed from the metabolism of ethylene glycol to oxalic acid. Note, fomipazole, a competitive inhibitor of alcohol dehydrogenase, is the preferred antidote for patients with ethylene glycol poisoning. Hemodialysis can be added in severely poisoned patients. Ingestion of excess vitamin C, ascorbic acid, can cause calcium oxalate stone formation because ascorbic acid is metabolized to oxalate. Increased free oxalate can precipitate and form stones. Note, vitamin C deficiency is also associated with calcium oxalate stone formation. Diagnosis. Light microscopy of calcium oxalate crystals shows colorless octahedral crystals, square crossed by a diagonal line in two-dimensional view that are classically described as envelope, calcium dihydrate or dumbbell-shaped calcium monohydrate. Calcium oxalate crystals seen in conditions like increased calcium, increased oxalic acid, ethylene glycol poisoning. Calcium stones are radiopaque on x-ray. Treatment. Calcium stones can be treated with hydration, thiazide diuretics, citrate. Citrate chelates calcium in the urine, thereby decreasing supersaturation and reducing the formation of crystals. Ammonium magnesium phosphate, struvite stones. Ammonium magnesium phosphate, struvite stones are most commonly caused by infection with a urease positive organism such as Proteus mirabilis, Klebsiella, Staphylococcus subspecies, Staphylococcus saprophyticus, Staphylococcus epidermidis. Pathophysiology. Urease-positive organisms hydrolyze urea to ammonia, a weak base, thereby alkalizing the urine and increasing the chances for precipitation of an ammonium-magnesium phosphate stone. Upper urinary tract infection with urease-producing bacteria such as Proteus mirabilis, Klebsiella, Staphylococcus saprophyticus, and or Pseudomonas.
These bacteria convert urea to ammonia, which shows up as elevated ammonia, causing alkaline urine, leading to precipitation of the ammonium-magnesium phosphate salt in crystal and stone formation. Diagnosis Ammonium-magnesium phosphate stones can form staghorn calculi, which are large, branching stones that fill all or most of the renal pelvis. Staghorn calculi can act as a nidus for urinary tract infections. Crystals with the coffin lid appearance on urinalysis are classically seen in patients with ammonium-magnesium phosphate kidney stones. Staghorn calculi are radiopaque and appear on x-ray. Treatment Ammonium-magnesium phosphate stones are treated with antibiotics directed against the underlying pathogen in surgical removal of the stone. Uric acid stones Uric acid stones are the third most common type of kidney stone. Risk factors include hot, arid climates, low urine pH, low urine volume. Uric acid stones are the most common stones in patients with gout or hyperuricemia from a leukemia or myeloproliferative disorder. Uricosuric agents, e.g. probenicid, increase the excretion of uric acid, which can accelerate the formation of stones. Diagnosis Rhomboid or rosette-shaped uric acid crystals are often seen in patients with uric acid nephrolithiasis. Uric acid stones are radiolucent on x-ray. Treatment Treatment of uric acid stones is focused on hydration and alkalizing the urine with potassium bicarbonate. Allopurinol can be used to treat gout, but not the stones themselves. Cysteine stones Cysteine stones are a rare cause of kidney stones that are seen in children. They're associated with cystinuria and autosomal recessive disease. Cystinuria is an autosomal recessive defect of tubular transporters, leading to decreased reabsorption of mnemonic coal, cysteine, ornithine, arginine, lysine. Diagnosis Patients with cystinuria have a positive sodium cyanide nitroprusset test. Sodium cyanide nitroprusset test mechanism. Cyanide converts cysteine to cysteine. Cysteine binds nitroprusset, turning the reaction red. Ammonium magnesium phosphate and cysteine stones can both form staghorn calculi. Hexagonal or benzene shaped crystals are classically associated with cysteine stones. Cysteine stones are faintly radiopaque on x-ray. Treatment Prophylactic treatment for cysteine stones include urinary alkalization, example, with acetazolamide or potassium citrate, low-sodium diet and increased hydration, chelation with agents such as penicillamine if alkalization and dietary changes fail. Clinical Manifestations Patients may occasionally be diagnosed with asymptomatic nephrolithiasis when an imaging exam of the abdomen is performed for other purposes or when surveillance imaging is done in those with a prior history of stones. Symptoms Patients occasionally present after having passed gravel or stone. Patients who form uric acid stones frequently describe passing gravel, but uric acid stones can also produce acute obstruction. Symptoms may develop when stones initially pass from the renal pelvis into the ureter. Pain is the most common symptom, which is severe unilateral and colicky flank pain, renal colic. The pain typically waxes and wanes in severity and develops in waves or paroxysms. Consequently, pain due to a kidney stone typically resolves quickly after passage of the stone. The area around the kidneys may be tender on percussion, costal vertebral angle tenderness. The site of obstruction determines the location of pain. Upper ureteral, or renal pelvic obstruction, led to flank pain or tenderness, whereas lower ureteral obstruction causes pain that may radiate to the ipsilateral testicle or labium. The location of the pain may change as the stone migrates. Many patients familiar with the symptoms are able to predict whether the stone has passed through the ureter. However, stones that are impacted or do not migrate cannot be localized with certainty based on symptoms alone. Hematuria. Gross or microscopic hematuria occurs in the majority of patients presenting with symptomatic nephrolithiasis, 
but is also often present in asymptomatic patients. Other than passage of a stone or gravel, this is the single most discriminating predictor of a kidney stone in patients presenting with unilateral flank pain. Complications Nephrolithiasis may lead to persistent renal obstruction, which could cause permanent renal damage if left untreated. Laboratory Test Urine Dipstick and Urinalysis Gross or Microscopic Hematoria Urine pH More than 7 suggest urea-splitting organisms and struvite stones. Less than 5 indicates uric acid stones. Diagnostic Imaging Selection of Modality CT of the abdomen and pelvis without contrast performed using low radiation dose protocols is the preferred exam for most adults with suspected nephrolithiasis. If CT technology is not available, ultrasound of the kidneys and bladder, sometimes in combination with abdominal pelvic radiography, is the second line option for initial imaging. Note Non enhanced CT scan is the gold standard. Ultrasound of the kidneys and bladder. Ultrasound of the kidneys and bladder reliably detects hydronephrosis and does not involve ionizing radiation. It's the preferred initial imaging modality in pregnant patients. Ultrasound is less accurate and demonstrates greater variability than CT of the abdomen and pelvis without contrast for the diagnosis of nephrolithiasis. Thus, a positive ultrasound often leads to a follow-up CT to enable treatment planning. Because CT detects nephrolithiasis, not diagnosed with ultrasound, a CT is sometimes performed after a negative ultrasound to evaluate for a stone if the index of clinical suspicion remains high. Ultrasound is less accurate than CT at measuring stone size and defining ureteral location. Magnetic Resonance Imaging MRI of the abdomen and pelvis, also called magnetic resonance urography, MRU, is rarely used for nephrolithiasis. Diagnostic Algorithm When a diagnosis of nephrolithiasis is clinically suspected, CT imaging of the kidneys, ureters, and bladder should be performed to confirm the presence of a stone and assess for signs of urinary obstruction. If a ureteral stone is detected, stone size and location are used to predict the likelihood of spontaneous passage and to guide management. Initially, the patient is symptomatically treated for pain control. We check if urosepsis is present. If yes, emergent decompression using a ureteral stent or nephrostomy tube is carried out and followed by urological evaluation. Extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy or uteroscope is used to remove the stone and then we evaluate and treat underlying cause of stone disease. If no urosepsis is present, we check if the stone is more than 10 millimeters. If yes, we follow the previously mentioned algorithm. If no, observe the patient, treat symptoms, alpha blockers are used, and advise to strain while passing urine. If the stone doesn't pass, we perform a urological evaluation and follow the algorithm. If stone is passed, then we evaluate and treat underlying cause of stone disease. Treatment Many patients with acute renal colic can be managed conservatively with pain medication and hydration until the stone passes. Both non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, NSAIDs, and opioids have traditionally been used for pain control in patients with acute renal colic. NSAIDs have the possible advantage of decreasing ureteral smooth muscle tone thereby directly treating the mechanism by which pain is thought to occur, ureteral spasm. Treatment depends on the size of the stone. Less than 5 millimeters, often passed spontaneously. Less than 10 millimeters, likelihood of spontaneous passage increases with alpha blocker or CCB therapy. More than 10 millimeters often requires shockwave lithotripsy or ureteral rhinoscopy. More than 20 millimeters, Percutaneous nephrolithotomy. Note, stone size is the major determinant of the likelihood of spontaneous stone passage, although stone location is also important. Most stones that are less than or equal to 5 mm in diameter pass spontaneously. For stones larger than 5 mm in diameter, there is a progressive decrease in the spontaneous passage rate, 
which is unlikely with stones more than or equal to 10 millimeters in diameter. Proximal ureteral stones are also less likely to pass spontaneously. Both tamsulosin and nifedipine have been shown to increase the likelihood of stone passage, with tamsulosin showing slightly better results. In patients with stones greater than 5 and less than 10 millimeters in diameter, we suggest treatment with tamsulosin for up to 4 weeks to facilitate stone passage. Non-invasive and surgical interventions. Indications. Stones more than 10 millimeters. Complicated stones. Failed medical therapy, relapse, recurrent infection. Extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. A non-invasive method enabling stone fragmentation using an acoustic pulse. Treatment option for renal and proximal ureteral stones more than 10 millimeters. Stones should be clearly visible on x-ray and or ultrasound. Not preferred in morbidly obese patients. Ureteral rhinoscopy. A transurethral endoscopic procedure used to visualize the urinary tract up to the renal pelvis for retrieval or destruction of urinary stones or sampling of biopsies. Treatment option for ureteral stones more than 10 millimeters. Percutaneous nephrolithotomy. A minimally invasive surgical procedure to retrieve kidney stones. Treatment option for renal stones more than 20 millimeters. Complications. Recurrent urinary tract infections leads to risk of pyelonephritis, urosepsis. Urinary obstruction leads to inflammation of the kidney and hydronephrosis. Prevention. Hydration. Sufficient water intake, more than or equal to 2.5 liters per day. Diet. For calcium stones. Reduce consumption of salt and animal protein. Reduce consumption of oxalate-rich foods and supplemental vitamin C for oxalate stones. Calcium intake should not be restricted. Note, low calcium diets increase the risk of calcium-containing stone formation because they increase oxalate reabsorption. For uric acid stones, diet low in purine. For cysteine stones, diet low in sodium is recommended. <laughs>